disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray? And I'd like you to join with me if you want to in the Lord's Prayer this morning. Our Father, Stand up and praise the Lord your God, who is from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry hosts, the earth, and all that is on it, the seas, and all that is in them. You give life to everything and the multitudes of heaven worship you. Our first hymn is Immortal Invisible. It is number 15 in the <coughs> hymn book. We're going to do all the verses. Let's stand and sing all the verses of number 15, Immortal Invisible. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, as I was growing up, my mother tried to teach me to pray. And she taught me a couple different prayers. And I mentioned last week that one of the things that we did almost every night was to have a bedtime prayer time. And she taught us very basically a children's prayer, which apparently I quoted wrong. <laughs> But it was, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. God bless mommy, daddy, sister, you know, you go through the list. But it, she also taught us a prayer of thanks before we ate. We always had, whether you call it a blessing or a prayer of thanksgiving, but we prayed before we would eat. And she taught us to pray, God is great, God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By thy hands we all are fed. Give us, God, our daily bread. And when we stayed a few months with my sister and her husband, and their kids were just little, we got tickled. Because one of my nieces, they were just little, I don't know, five, four little ones. But my brother-in-law and sister would have the kids pray. And one of the girls almost always prayed, make this food yummy and tasty and balanced to my body. <laughs> like, well, that's a good thing to pray. There's a lot of different types of prayers that people pray over their food. This one says, bless us, O Lord, for these thy gifts, which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. That's a good one. This one is called an Irish prayer. I don't know why, but because there's nothing about potatoes in it. But it does say, bless, O Lord, the food we are about to eat. And we pray you, O God that it may be good for our body and soul. And if there be any poor creature hungry or thirsty walking along the road, send them in to us so that we can share the food with them, just as you share your gifts with all of us. Now, that's a good one. That one's worth memorizing. That's a good prayer. The practice of praying before meals really has deep roots. Prayer can be traced way back in Jewish history, all the way back through the Old Testament. But prayer can transform, I believe, any ordinary meal into a spiritual experience. Now, I don't know if it's your practice to pray over your meals, to pray over your food, but it is a biblical practice. In Jewish culture, blessings were recited before each meal in accordance with, of course, religious laws. Now, these traditions not only express gratitude for God's blessing, but also recognize his dominion over all creation. And we sang about that this morning. The early Christians were heavily influenced by Judaism because Christianity kind of arose out of Judaism, and the practice of Jesus was influenced by what he learned growing up. And so the early church adapted this practice of praying for their meals in their own communities. It was a continuing practice. Prayer before meals isn't merely an habitual act. It's not something that's just habitual. I always get tickled because it's not only in this church, not so much recently, but uh, in most churches, when we had church dinners, things would be ready. But, of course, the pastor is still greeting the last people to leave and, and doing what pastors do at the end of a service. And everybody is standing around waiting for the preacher to come to bless the food. And people are getting a little annoyed because I want to eat and the preacher's not here. But it's not only at church dinners. It's other places where it becomes the habitual practice for the preacher to pray. Even when I was attending rotary meetings, every time I was there for the luncheon, well, it was my job to say the blessing over the food, which I did. 
but it just becomes more of a habit than a meaningful spiritual experience. Because the practice really acknowledges God as our provider and gives us an opportunity to express gratitude for his blessings. And the Bible gives us example of this practice. Jesus himself, remember, took the loaves and the fishes prior to feeding the 5,000. And it says this in Luke 9, 16, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Now, there are two recorded episodes in the Gospel of Luke where in his resurrected life, Jesus prays with and for his disciples. Now, this is our final study in the series that we've been looking at for a number of weeks, praying the way that Jesus prayed. Which, remember, for those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, for those that have received him as their Lord and Savior, we are being conformed into the likeness of Christ. That's what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. And so if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are in the process of being conformed to the likeness of his son. We can use the theological term sanctification in that process. That process of sanctification is simply being conformed to the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that likeness that we have seen through the Gospel of Luke was that Jesus in his humanity as a man was a man of constant prayer. And so our prayer life, if we are being conformed into the likeness of Christ, our prayer life ought to resemble the prayer life of Jesus. And so when we pray like Jesus prayed, we will see transformation and supernatural events, supernatural intervention in our lives. Because our prayers, our prayers will be answered. When Jesus prayed, do you think God the Father answered his prayers? Don't you think that? If anybody ever got their prayers answered, it should have been Jesus. And so if we begin to pray like Jesus, we can pray with that expectation that God the Father is going to hear and he's going to answer those prayers because we are praying like Jesus prayed. Now the first episode in the Gospel of Luke of the resurrected Jesus praying with his disciples is with the two disciples that he meets, he meets up with on the road to Emmaus. So open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. This is one of my favorite resurrection appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ. On the road to Emmaus with the disciples. And as you're turning to Luke 24, listen to what Vance Havner, one of my favorite old time preachers from North Carolina, from Hickory, North Carolina, said in his book, Why Not Just Be Christians? He said this about the appearance of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. The living Christ walks beside us, ready to change us from weaklings to witnesses, to give us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He may not meet us in a blinding vision or in a thrilling ecstasy, but if we have trusted him, and yet our faith has grown dim and dry and disappointing, we have a right to a brand new experience of the living Christ which will turn us around on the Emmaus Road, straighten our drooping shoulders, and start us out in another direction to bless others, even as we have been blessed. That's the Emmaus encounter with Jesus. So look in Luke 24, look at beginning in verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures? 
I want us to consider, first of all, the prayer of blessing. Jesus enters this home as the guest. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus invite Jesus into their home as a guest. But Jesus assumes the role of the host. He takes over. He becomes the host. And so I want us to see, first of all, the recognition of Jesus at the disciples' table. Jesus, it said, he's, the scripture says, took the bread. And he would look up to heaven and say the blessing. The blessing would have been a prayer of thanksgiving. It would have been a prayer that probably would have started with, with blessed art thou, O Lord. And then go on to specify that for which thanks were being offered. The bread was commonly broken at the prayer of thanksgiving before meal. Because remember the, prayer, the bread was baked or prepared as a loaf. We didn't, they didn't go to the cupboard or go to the store and buy a loaf of bread. Sliced bread. It was, oh, we would say homemade bread, but it was baked in a loaf. And as they gave the blessing, the bread would be broken. And there was something in the action. And this prayer of blessing that Jesus offered that caused the eyes of these disciples to be opened. And it says they recognized him. All the while they walked on the road to Emmaus and they talked with Jesus. They didn't know who he was. And they, but he explained the scripture to him. It said, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures? God was working in their hearts as Jesus was explaining from the Old Testament everything the Old Testament said about him. But when he sat at the table with them, and blessed the food and broke the bread. Their eyes were opened. Perhaps they saw as he broke the bread. This is just suppose. But as he broke the bread. They would have seen his hands. They would have seen the nail scars in his hands. As he broke the bread. Probably for the first time. But I think his actions as he broke the bread and he gave thanks and broke the bread and says, then he gave it to them. I think his actions were similar to the actions that he did that night of the Passover before he went to the garden and was betrayed. We celebrate it. What we call communion where it says Jesus broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. I think as Jesus sat at their table, and again, he became the host. He's the one that takes charge, and he offers the blessing, and he gives thanks and breaks the bread and offers it to them. Suddenly their minds were like, this is Jesus. Jesus is here. At that moment, they recognized that this was the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Jesus. And for whatever reason, it says they, they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. They recognized him and it was like, Boop, I'm out of here. And he was gone. Well, the second thing I want us to consider with the prayer of blessing here is the recognition the recognition of Jesus at, at your table, at our table. Praying like Jesus prayed means that before you eat, you take time to recognize God's blessing in your life. By recognizing God's blessing in your life, that he has provided food for you to eat. And you give thanks for his love and grace. You see, the dinner table especially is a great place to recognize the presence of Jesus and to praise him. You praise him as the provider of all my needs. Now, I know that family dinner times have changed dramatically since I was a kid, probably since you've been a kid. 
Families don't always get together and eat all together anymore. Sometimes they do, but lives have become so hectic, schedules are so full. Spending time around the dinner table can be a challenge. But praying before you eat, whether it's having everybody together around the table or whether you are eating lunch with everybody at work or whether it's um, having your lunch by yourself out under a tree, you need to pray before you eat because praying before you eat with, will keep, I believe, your communion with God through the Lordship of Christ really in your common everyday activities. In other words, it's not just a religious activity. It's not something just the pastor does when he's around or when he comes over to visit. We recognize the activity of God in our everyday lives. And so praying at every meal is important because our daily bread, Jesus said, and Mike led us in the Lord's Prayer, part of that prayer is give us today our daily what? Bread. So who feeds you? My wife. No, it's not your wife. It's not your husband. It's God. And so our daily bread is provided for us and broken to us by the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew Henry in his commentary said, Whenever, wherever we sit down to eat, let us set Christ at the upper end of the table. Take our meat as blessed to us by him and eat and drink to his glory and receive contentedly and thankfully what he is pleased to provide. Be the fare ever so coarse and meager, we may well receive it cheerfully if we can by faith see it coming to us from Christ's hands and with his blessings. That's powerful. We are to receive our food with thanksgiving through prayer. Do you do that? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. And I want us to begin in verse 3. Paul writing to Timothy says, They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from central food. So Paul is writing to Timothy about false teachers who are laying down legalistic rules and restrictions. And they are telling new believers, well, that as a Christian, there are certain things. You know, it's better for you uh, to marry. They are uh, forbidding people to marry. And we saw that in Sunday school. God said... It's not good for man to be alone. God hasn't created us to be alone. We need companionship. But also to abstain from certain foods. In other words, like the dietary laws of the Old Testament, he's saying, well, you can eat this, but you can't eat that. You can't eat this, but you can eat this. And Paul says, and you may want to underline in your Bible, God created Food to be received with thanksgiving. God created food to be received. And we receive it with thanksgiving. Now look at verse 4 and 5. For everything God created is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. There's a lot to digest. <laughs> That's a pun. And there's a lot to digest here, but look at it this way. And you may want to underline those verses. It says, for everything God created is good. I like that. Everything God created is good. And nothing is to be rejected. And you may want to underline that. Nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. Now let me ask you, how many times have... You've been to somebody's house or maybe your wife or your husband has prepared something and you sit down and you say, or you heard your kids say, 
I don't like that. I would never eat that. Scripture here says everything is good. Yeah, not on my taste buds. But God said, everything is good. Missionaries will tell you that when you go to another country and you are learning the culture, you are learning to minister to people, you eat what is set before you without any questions. We've had to learn that because we have ministered cross-culturally in a lot of different ways. But, he says, it is to be received with thanksgiving. Well, I may not like it, but I'm going to eat it because God said it's good. And I'm going to receive it with thanksgiving because he says it is consecrated by the word of God and, and prayer. When I pray for our food, and I may have said it here at church, I always pray. Lord, sanctify this food. It's consecrated. I don't know what's in it. But God consecrates it. He sanctifies it. So that when I eat it, as you can tell, I have no digestive problems. <laughs> Everything is good. And is to be received with thanksgiving. And we pray. Sanctify it by the word of God. Pray. When you fail to pray, when you fail to pray a blessing before you consume a meal, I think you demonstrate an attitude like the character that Jimmy Stewart plays in a movie called Shenandoah. Now, Shenandoah, Jimmy Stewart played a man by the name of Charlie Anderson who was a widower in the Shenandoah Valley. And his family is being strained by the Civil War. He loses family members because of the war. But he's always asked to say grace at the dinner table and understand he has had a terrible life. I mean, gone through one problem after another. He has a bitter attitude. And here's his prayer in that movie. And I think this is the kind of attitude we display. If you fail to do what Jesus did and bless, pray it, a prayer blessing. He said this, Lord, we cleared this land. We plowed it, sowed it, and harvested it. We cooked the harvest. It wouldn't be here if we wouldn't, and we wouldn't be eating it if we had done it, if we hadn't done it all ourselves. We worked dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel. But we thank you, Lord, just the same for the food we're about to eat. Amen. You ever prayed that kind of prayer? You may not have said it, but sometimes that's our attitude when we don't take the time to make our meal a place of worship and thanksgiving and gratitude. Well, there's one last prayer the resurrected Jesus prayed. And that's here in Luke chapter 24. So go back to Luke 24. And we're going to look at verse 50. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. And I call this the benediction. Benediction and blessing are kind of the same. But this is the benediction of Jesus. Jesus took the initiative. He led the disciples out into the vicinity of Bethany. That was near Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. Because Bethany was located on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. And it was there he led his disciples and he led them with a purpose. So that they would be the literal eyewitnesses of his ascension to heaven. And we are given more detail about that in Acts chapter 1. But here I want us to see the pronouncement of Jesus. It says he lifted up his hands and blessed them. He lifted up his hands. That's 
Sim that would be similar to what the high priest would do in the temple in the Old Testament. And it's the only time that the Bible records that Jesus lifted up his hands to pray over people. But he lifted up his hands and prayed in that Old Testament priestly blessing, I believe, from Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26, where Moses is instructed to tell Aaron, the high priest, this is the benediction that the high priest was to pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. As Jesus lifted up his hands, I believe he prayed that over his disciples. And it says, as he continued, as he, was, as he left them and was taken up to heaven, he continued blessing them. The disciples heard a prayer. They saw a prayer because these outstretched hands of Jesus had nail prints in them that Jesus bore for them. The marks of the cross. And so there's a little bit of a difference. The blessing are statements of blessing that are pronouncement of God's grace. And they are conferred on other people. And they declare God's goodness on other people. So you can pray a blessing on people. You ever done that? Asking God to bless them for God's grace, for God's goodness to be on them. But I believe this prayer was more of a benediction. A benediction is a declaration of God's blessing on people. And it includes a request for divine help, divine guidance, for God's love to be bestowed on them. And it's usually given in our day at the end of a worship service. At the end, the benediction is pronounced. Now, we don't do it formally. Some churches do a formal Benediction. Again, Matthew Henry in his commentary on Luke said, his being parted from them did not put an end to his blessing them for the intercession which he went to heaven to make for all his as a continuation of his blessing. He began to bless them on earth, but he went to heaven to go on with it. That's what we're told in Hebrews. We are told that our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, ascended into heaven. And he is there making intercession for each one of us. We've already talked about that in this series. That Jesus is praying for us. But he is blessing you. That prayer benediction is continuing as he continues to hold out his hands and pray God's blessing on us. The ultimate blessing that God has given, of course, is the eternal life and forgiveness that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Have you received those blessings? Have you received those blessings of God, of every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus? That's a lot of blessing. We need to receive God's blessing. We need to count our blessings. That's a great song, isn't it? Count your many blessings. See what God has done. Because Jesus pronounced the benediction. And the result there is the praise of the disciples. They worshipped him. And says they worshipped him with great joy. Warren Wiersbe in his commentary on Luke said, The last thing our Lord did was to bless his people, and the first thing they did was to worship him. The two always go together. He opened their lips to worship and praise him. You want your worship experience on Sunday to be full of joy? Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And when you come to the service, all you can do is praise and worship God with great joy. Because just think of everything that he's done for you. 
Now, I would assume, because I can see you, and you're sitting here in a pew this morning, that most of you got out of bed this morning. Some of you may still be asleep, but you did get out of bed, and you came to church. Isn't that a blessing? I had a friend that always said, he's blessed because he was vertical and he was ventilating. <laughs> he was upright and he could breathe. How are you? Well, I'm vertical and ventilating. Can you praise God for that? You may not be able to praise God for anything else, but do you have a roof <laughs> over your head? Some people in Tennessee and North Carolina and Florida don't. Do you have food to eat? We still got leftovers from last weekend. And when we eat leftovers, I say, Lord, thank you for blessing us so that we can have seconds. You're blessed. We need to receive it. We need to give thanks. We need to worship with joy. So the question is, are you being conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ? If you are, you can pray like Jesus prayed. As you pray God's blessing for your food, as you gather around the table, even if you're by yourself, you can confess Jesus as your provider. You can acknowledge your dependence upon him and give thanks. You can turn that mealtime into a worship service. Jesus will reveal himself and turn your meal into a time of praise. You can pray a benediction. You can pray a prayer of blessing over people. A release of God's grace and goodness into their lives. That will result in praise and worship on their behalf as they experience God's grace and God's goodness. Jesus began his ministry that we've looked at here in the book of Luke at his baptism, and he began it in prayer. He ended his earthly ministry. Now I know he's alive and lives forevermore, and he has ascended into heaven. He is interceding for us, and we receive all of the blessings that he has provided. But when he left this earth, he left this earth praying as he went. Jesus was a person of constant prayer. Are you that way? If you are being conformed into the image of Christ, then that prayer life of Jesus ought to be your prayer life where you find yourself praying, as the Bible says, in all things. Pray without ceasing. Well, that pretty much describes the life of Jesus. And that's how Jesus wants you to pray. Father, we have tried to cover this topic through the book of Luke. And I think we've probably just scratched the surface. John, when he wrote his gospel, told us that the world could not contain all of the books that could be written about the life of Jesus. But we've looked at as much as we can through the Gospel of Luke to try to learn how to pray like you, Lord Jesus. And I just ask in your name that you would begin that work of transformation and conforming us to your image and likeness and reproducing your life of prayer in us. That, Father, we would be people who never fail, whether in private or in public, to take the time to pray for our food. That, Father, we would be bold and pronounce a benediction of blessing upon our families, upon our friends and neighbors and the people here in the church. Father, we thank you for all that you've given to us in Christ Jesus. Help us to walk in faith and receive all that you have provided for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.
Mike announced and, and shared with you a little bit about the insert that's in your bulletin. Devote yourselves to prayer. The logical conclusion of this whole series of studies is to put into practice what we've learned. And we do have prayer services on Sunday morning that's early. We do have a noon prayer service. But I want to encourage you that if you would want to strengthen your prayer life, want to join together in prayer, to complete this whatever day of the week is convenient for you, best for you, what time of day, put your name on it. You can give it to me. Give it to one of the elders. Because we need to come together as a church. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, Jesus is here. The world's not going to get any better. And the Bible says, as we see the day approaching, we need to meet together and encourage one another. And we'll do that through prayer. What we studied in Sunday school this morning said we need companionship. We need each other. We need to pray. So my encouragement to you this morning in response to this whole series of messages is for you to be committed to the ministry of prayer. Not just by yourself. Like I said, you can get the email from the church. But we need to gather together as brothers and sisters and pray for one another. Pray for our community. Pray for our country. Pray for God's church around the world. Let's sing together. Oh, come to the altar. Our last song.
Jesus, as we go from this place, help us to tell the world of the treasure we have found in you. The hope, the joy, the peace, the provision that you make for all of our needs. We give you thanks. And Lord Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen.